Our guest on ANN TV this week is Mark Hamley, a diplomat who served as ambassador in Qatar and Lebanon. Welcome back to ANN Satellite Television. Our guest today is Mark Hamley, Ambassador Hamley, a good friend and indeed former U.S. Ambassador to Qatar and Lebanon and spokesperson on many issues, former representative for climate change. Mark, it's great to have you with us. We are going to focus, I know, on three issues. We'll be talking about the whole business of ISIS, the emergence of ISIS as a force. We'll be talking about the Houthi in Yemen, and we'll be talking about the Middle East peace process. We'll just go to a short video, and then we'll begin. Excellent. Thank you, William. The ISIS-led insurgency has escalated at an alarming rate in recent months, generating virtually constant global coverage. While some view ISIS as a medieval organization, its ability to entice foreign thrill-seeking fighters through the employment of new media strategies propels them into the 21st century. Described as brutal extremist terrorists, the group threatens to establish an ever-growing caliphate, beginning in Iraq and Syria. The battle between ISIS and the West, notably the US, is going to be a protracted conflict. A topic that has fallen rather by the wayside in comparison is that of the Houthi insurgency in Yemen. Self-styled the Ansarullah, the partisans of God, the Houthis began as a theological movement that preached tolerance and peace in the early 1990s. Since 2004, however, the group has turned to arms as tension between the group and the governments of Yemen and Saudi Arabia flared. The Houthi played a prominent role in Yemen's 2011 uprising. Today they demand a replacement for what they describe as the corrupt government. Some say the Houthis pose a threat to regional security. Others claim they act as a counter to Al-Qaeda. Returning to a subject held the spotlight for decades, the Palestinian and Israeli conflict is evolving. The recent Gaza war saw innumerable Palestinian civilians fall, and Amnesty International accused Israel of committing war crimes during their campaign. Though the summer's violent battle has ended, peace remains a distant dream. Many doubt prospects for a meaningful peace accord between the Palestinians and Israel. So Mark, let's start this discussion. Uh, we have these staggeringly important topics. Let's just start with uh, perhaps the most contentious, the most disturbing of the lot, the whole issue of the emergence of the so-called Islamic State, the ISIS group in America called ISIL, um, but it's just semantics, I guess. Um, a force that is going to be with us for decades, presumably. I mean, are, are we going to are we going to see a swift end to this? Well, thank you, William. That's indeed a very important topic. I think it's a very appropriate one to begin with in our discussion mm -hmm. today. Um, ISIS will be around for, for quite, quite a while. But I think it's important when we look at the United States, at the moment it becomes a, an issue really about Islam versus Christianity versus the world. I think it's very important to, uh, to, to make it very clear that ISIS is about as, as Islamic as the Ku Klux Klan is Christian. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's an important distinction because ISIS is, did not resent Islam. Um, the tenets are basically uh, non-Islamic, the, the beheadings, the violence. These are not um, forms of, of combat or forms of, of life which are accepted by, by, by Islam. And I think that's been made very clear by representatives of religious thought from Cairo al-Azhar to the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia who has come up very strongly against ISIS as being a... a it, an aberration, not as the mainstream thought. But I think that will be around for quite a while, and I think it will be around for quite a while because, in part, there's no coordinated response 
by those who oppose ISIS. In order to be successful, you have to have three basic components. You have to have a command, you have to have discipline, and you have to have morale. And all three of those components are very much um, fulfilled by ISIS in terms of its, its ability to, to uh, set out a strategy, to fall through on that strategy, and to mobilize um, adherents to come from abroad to support that strategy. On the other hand, you have a, the American-led coalition which has been established to confront this does not have a good command, there's no, no real strategy. Um, President uh, Obama very correctly um, said we don't want to enter into the fray until we have a strategy to know what we're going to do, what our end goals are. He established an end goal, which is rather unrealistic, I think, the end goal being the diminution and the eventual elimination of ISIS from the area. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, he launched an air campaign which is not the way to do it because you have to have a different, different whole coalition of forces to do that, and that is not at the moment in, in sight. Yes, it's also interesting. I mean, we, we saw these terrible pictures. I don't, I don't, I mean, I feel, I don't want to feel disloyal here because I really do feel ISIS is an atrocious organization. But the air campaign we've just seen on uh, the area south of Baghdad Jisr al Sagrur, I believe, has um, essentially left the. It no longer exists. I mean, they have wiped out vast. And I'm not blaming the Americans. It's, it's coalition forces that include the Iraq Air Force, that include others. Um, but the, the, and, and it's bombardment as well. But it's been so intense that um, the this can't be a solution, not, not bombing a place flat. I mean, it, it can, it, it's, it's not the way. Um, especially given the history of our involvement, we have had um, of the history of the, our allies' involvement because over the summer there was some very unfortunate barrel bombing of Fallujah. Mm. And, exactly. And, um, so we need to find a way to win the hearts and minds of the Sunni population and and presumably this is not it. I'm afraid that one of, the, one of the issues at play here is that we have not learned the lessons of the past. In the United States, that means we back to lessons of, of Vietnam and lessons of our engagements in both uh, Afghanistan and in Iraq earlier in this century. Um, by that I mean in Vietnam there was a case of one village which was completely destroyed in order to liberate and destroy it. And that seems to be what we're doing again in terms of our campaign against ISIS. And if that's going to be the thrust of our campaign, then it will be hopeless. That will not be successful. I think to the extent in which we've used uh, air power uh, appropriately to defend um, in coordination with, with defense, defense efforts on the part of the Kurds and on parts of some of the Iraqi forces as well and some of their ways to keep uh, the ISIS forces from the gates of Baghdad, keep them, keep them out of uh, the gates of Arbil. Uh, from taking over the Mosul Dam. I think that has been a very, uh, a very appropriate use of air power. Some of the other um, um, areas where we've used have not been as effective. In part, that's because it's a politically controlled air, air attack. It's not done with a, a military component on that as much as it should be. And I think that that's, that's, you know, that's one of why we've seen such disasters in terms of some of, the, some of these air campaigns. But I think the, when you get down to the problem of organizing a coalition, this is something where the United States and the Western powers, we really have to take a back seat on this. If, we're, if ISIS is to be uh, contained and, and eventually eliminated, it'll take boots on the ground, but those boots have got to be boots from the Arab, from the Arab world itself. Um, because you know. we're too frightened? No, I think the difficulty is we have no, um, we're viewed as crusaders. This is, we, we feed into the rhetoric which ISIS uh, puts out that um, one of their things is we've got to eliminate the, uh, these regimes which are built up by colonialists. They use those phrases about the colonial powers being uh, the ones which created the old Sykes-Picot borders. The Islam has got to come in and take over the new, uh, the, the Islamic world as it should be. But then, then we sit back as, uh, and, and, and fly drones while, and watch Arabs sacrifice their lives. To no, I don't think that that's the case. I think it's very much a case where We've got to get the, 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 the countries in the area, I think, certainly have to recognize, I think they do recognize that this is a problem which is an existential threat to their existence. And that goes there for Saudi Arabia, for Jordan, for Lebanon, and for the countries of the Gulf eventually, and also for Turkey and Egypt. It's a very major problem for them. But what, because of the, um, it's one of the situations where you have the, the Iranians on the one hand, the Saudis on the other, 
are both against ISIS. But then you have the Turks as well against ISIS. But the Turks and the Saudis are against uh, Bashar al-Assad. The Iranians support Bashar al-Assad. The Egyptians are focused on the Muslim Brotherhood. They're not really focused on Bashar al-Assad or ISIS. So all these countries, frankly, ISIS is not the number one priority. And I think until it becomes number one priority, and until they find a way in which they form their own coalition supported by the United States and other powers, I don't think ISIS is going to be eliminated. But there is also a level of doublespeak. Um, we perceive ISIS as a threat. Uh, many nations in the region don't truly think of ISIS in the same terms that we do. They may be afraid of ISIS expansionism moving into the region. But, uh, for instance, the, the classic case of mm. Turkey. Turkey um, has bought, it's hard to know, but cer certainly somewhere above $800 million dollars of ISIS oil. The only way we could stop that going on and continuing is to bomb refineries within Syria because we can't control the Turks. The Turks, the volunteers from Britain or from, well, from the volunteers from Libya even, the mm. 3,000 volunteers from Libya or more. Or uh, Tunisia, there's yeah, a bigger uh, country. Yes. They all go through yeah. Istanbul, yeah. all go down and all present their passports uh, before uh, two Turkish border guards before they cross into Syria. Mm. So they're all, I mean, Turkey and more to the point, the, the interesting s little siege of Kobani, mm. I know an isolated I incident, but... Mm. And an auto. Yeah, yeah mm. but we had an airdrop supplies in, mm -hmm. uh, some of which were <laughs> yes, famously it found, yeah. found their way into the ISIS hands. I had to airdrop supplies in because we couldn't deliver supplies across the Turkish border because the Turks weren't cooperating. Um, so, and you could say that they were actually quite gleeful about the fact that the PYD, which is allied in a sense to the PKK indirectly or is perceived as being that, uh, was, was on the back foot. Uh, so, so the, the, the it's a, it's a strange situation. It's not, mm. it's not as we think it. I think this is one reason why should we be engaging so, so vehemently in terms of military campaign if the countries in the region are not doing the same thing. They're the ones which, who are really the ones who are on the front line at the moment. We are not. ISIS does not pose the threat to the United States of America at the moment or to Europe at the moment. It will over time, if it's successful in its efforts to overthrow these, these regimes one after another, if it's successful in terms of bringing that 50,000 square mile country, make it into 100,000, 200,000 square miles with its own ability to, uh, to uh, use some of these foreign fighters, return to their home soil and create uh, incidents in Paris, London, New York, wherever, then it becomes threat to everybody else. But at the moment, it's concentrated on the Middle East. And, and Turkey is a good case in point. Turkey has a problem. They want to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. And they also want to make sure that the that the arms which the PYD have, um, the YP, what, what, what? No, PYD, you're, P, you're PYD. right, the PYD, yeah. uh, PYD is indeed strongly connected to PKK, and the PKK is a terrorist organization, mm -hmm. and by Turkish terms, by American terms, European terms as well. Um, that may change in the future, but at the moment it's still on a terrorism list. And Turkey has been fighting for many years to keep PKK from, from disrupting the southeastern quadrant of, of, of um, of Turkey and from various terrorist acts which conducted in Ankara and in Istanbul all over the country. So Turkey is in a real sensitive situation. They have a peace process which is faltering at the moment, which Erdogan has been very strongly a proponent of in the past, and that is teetering on, on failing because of the, the um, antagonism that the PKK is showing towards Turkish non-support for their brethren across the border in Syria. Well, it's understandable yeah. though. Very understandable from a Turkish point of view. But I think what, in order to uh, to 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 make this this a, a positive coalition, you've got to look at what countries, in fact, can be the ones that that, that organize this this potential coal coalition in the future. Can it be the Saudis? Can it be the Egyptians? Can it be the Turks? Has to be a major country. The Iranians also have a key role on this. Well, we won't talk to the Iran. I mean, there's a there's a, there's a case in point because the Iranians need to be in the discussions yes. um, very much so because we need to support. Hyder al-Abadi, yes. uh, the new Prime Minister Indeed. of Iraq, uh, who is the, I mean, all our hopes are in this basket. We need, we need this guy. We need this guy to succeed, mm -hmm. really. And um, for him to succeed, 
we have to empower him. And part of the process mm. of empowering him is disempowering the more extreme militias. Um, and I'm talking very specifically about Kesal Kazali's yeah. mm -hmm. group, uh, which goes, at least we perceive, as going out and, and being involved in sectarian exactly. violence, mm. which is part of, it's not part of the solution. So, and to do that, we need Iran. We need Iran to, to rein him in. Um, I mean, he's ultimately an Iran loyalist. He has to be reined in. Mm. Um, why isn't Iran in these discussions? Well, sort of the United States is in, a, is in a position. We do not have diplomatic relations with Tehran. Turkey does, Egypt does, Saudi Arabia does. Most of the Gulf countries have ambassadors in Tehran. They do at least have a diplomatic frame in which they can discuss these issues with the Iranians. We cannot do so in the same, in the same manner. This is why I think if you're, you've got to find a way where the old, that old adage, the enemy of the enemy is my friend, You've got to find out, okay, who's your enemy? Everybody has enemies with one another party. Uh, Iran has misgivings about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has misgivings about Bashar al-Assad. Uh, you know, Iran likes Bashar al-Assad. Turkey doesn't like Assad. That like, doesn't want problems with Iran. Egypt, you know, folks... But, but you're letting, I mean, surely, you know, because you talk, you, we, uh, we talk. I mean, mm. I'm Anglo-American. I'm as much American as I'm British. We talk to Iran on the nuclear issue day in, day out. I mean, why can't we talk to them on, on this much more important November, issue? Yeah. No. Well, it's not that much more important issue. The nuclear issue is key, as you know, William. But, well, I mean, not at this moment. Does it really matter? <laughs> it does. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> it's I another type of discussion. But in any event, the, the issue is that should the U.S. be in the forefront of this fight? My point is it should not. It, we should be strongly supportive of our allies in the region. They should be the ones in support. We should be supporting the Iraqi government, as you indicated. We've got to uh, try and get the to, to We've got to train that force there. We're doing that. But it's going to take over a year to train, retrain the Iraqi well, army. Forever. And who knows what's going to happen then? Will they, you know... These forces in Syria, we're trying to train them too. Will, will they stay with us? They can follow instructions? I don't think so. Past pattern indicates it isn't. We need to look at the whole situation from anew. And I think the whole look at the situation from anew means to, uh, to work more with Bashar al-Assad, very quietly perhaps, but I think that he's part of the problem too and part of the solution. Same thing with Iran. Yeah, but we are not in this process. We're not going to, I mean, the Iraq army is not going to retake Mosul. No. So we have a situation which you have to come to terms with. How do we do that? Do we, um, do we start talking, for example, to, I, I mean, you have a lot of Ba'athists, ISIL, who are involved in, in exactly. ISIL. It's not just uh, um, ISIL or ISIS. Um, should we be talking to some of these people around the fringes, some of the... Uh, men of the Naqshbandi or whatever you like to call them, should we be engaging in discussions with people who are part of this insurgency which is spearheaded by ISIS in order to, to, to find a way out of this catastrophe or is that not the way to go? Well, I think we certainly have to find ways in which we can influence what's happening within, within Daesh, within uh, ISIS. Um, and I think sort of the Ba'athist elements are elements which can be we have kind of discussion with them. But again, that plays into the Iraqi domestic politics. Um, as you know, the, the, they are going to have to come to terms with setting up a, a truth reconciliation process or something mm. in order to put this, Very this, this much turn so. that page aside. Until the, the Iraqi government can agree that one of the main complaints of the Sunnis, one of the reasons why they joined uh, in support of Daesh so, so fervently was because of their treatment their perceived treatment under the Shiites, which is very, very rough. And they've mm -hmm. got to reintegrate the country, but they have to get, give, I think, uh, more um, um, prominence to the issues of, of regional authority for Ambar and for some of these uh, Sunni majority regions, um, much like the Kurds. The Constitution indicates they can do this, and I think that should be part of, part of a political process to, to resolve this problem. So, so do you believe that the, the I mean, uh, I, obviously, you believe, as I do, in a Truth and Reconciliation Committee uh, type approach for Iraq. And there are other good Iraqis that have advocated this, including Shiite Iraqis, yeah, some exactly. very prominent yeah. Shiite Iraqis. Um, do you believe in the 
to there, there are two different approaches being preached. One is the total repeal of the debarthification mm. laws, and one is their amendment. Uh, in which would you? I would frankly think that <laughs> you could perhaps make it political solvable say we're going to amend them, but in fact gut them and, and remove them. But I think if you're going to really make a statement to the Sunnis, you're serious, you've got to say, time enough, those are aside now, um, and we're going to you know, reconcile with the Ba'athist cells which exist in, in Iraq. Um, and bring Sunnis in general into the country uh, and mm. empower them a lot more than they are presently at the present time in mm. the uh, process. Interesting. So there's hope um, with regard to dealing with this, this crisis in terms of ISIS. Um, a little bit, not much. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all good and well for us to sit and tell the Iraqis what they should do in terms of these issues. These issues are gut wrenching for many Shiites, gut wrenching for many Sunnis. Um, they are at a, a point in their history where they've got to make key decisions. There's so many people who are still without their are, are dis displaced from their homes in mm -hmm. Iraq. That issue has got to be addressed. You have uh, such a, there's still no resolution between the, between the Kurds and the, and the Shiite government in terms of the, the oil process, the oil um, revenues. These issues have got to be addressed. And I'm sure that Tahadul Abadi has that on his, on his list of 10 most important things to do. But you've got to bring, uh, bring, bring rock around domestically. And I, I think it's going to take a long time, longer than a year. And indeed, Iraq will, in some senses, remain a confederation. I mean, uh, three loosely affiliated sub-states, uh, that's, that's going to be the case. It's not, we're not going back to a united Iraq in the old-fashioned sense. It's not possible, is it? Well, I don't think, uh, I think no Iraq would ever admit that. I think reality will over time present what the form the Iraq will take. I think certainly if Daesh had its way, there will be no Iraq. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that Hyderabad Badi wants to make sure that he's prime minister of, of a unified Iraq, and that's what his, his goal is. I think we, as ones who, uh, worked very hard to have a constitu provisional constitution which took into account the various interests of, of different parties in the country. I think we've got to try to see that process fulfilled. And that means giving uh, the Sunnis um, more access to their own resources, more access to their own governance than they've had in the past. And I think the same thing, frankly, in the South. There's areas in, in the Shiite region of the South also like to have opportunities. Yes, yes, yes. So, so this gets this where it's a bit, bit awkward for Hadul Abadi because mm -hmm. he is prime minister of the entire country. But again, he's just started in office. I think he's a very good man. I think he's the, the, perfect, yes. the perfect choice for this, uh, this momentous historic moment in Iraq's history. And I think what we've got to do is make sure we're supporting him in his efforts and not any way, shape, or form trying to, uh, 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 to pull the rug out from under him. Absolutely. Well, we've talked about Iraq. The problem is not going to go away, but and, and maybe Iraq and Syria, uh, yes. Heaven knows how this is all going to resolve itself. Um, can we shift to another topic, uh, one that may or may not be more positive? Um, that of Yemen, a country very close to your heart. Uh, Yemen is, uh, well, a precious place, but one I've only visited or skirted into. I've never really got to know or to... to to, you've lived there for years. Yes, a few years. That's yes, four years. Actually. And um, particularly, we were going to talk about the Houthi. Tell us about what are the Houthi? I mean, who are the Houthi? What are the Houthi? What do they believe? What is their... Well, I hope we do do a better job with Yemen than we did on, on Iraq and Syria. With <laughs> yes, yes. And I think if you ask most, uh, most American officials, they'd probably be just as grown about what's happening with the Houthis as was happened with ISIS. So the Saudis would be. The Saudis mm -hmm. do not like the Houthis at all. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the reason why the Houthis uh, were first uh, came into the picture about a decade ago. Uh, about a decade ago. You know, in, in, uh, in Yemen, you have always had traditionally a, um, a split between the, the Zaydis, who are a sort of what's called fifth wheel of, of, Sh of Shiite, mm -hmm. uh, Shiaism, and you have the Shafi, who are Sunnis in the south. These were the two major um, blocks of, of, of Muslims in, in the country of Yemen. Um, and the Zaydis, um, the reason they call them the fifth wheel is they're not Twelver uh, uh, Shiites, as is Iran and most other Shiites. They call them, I think, they're the Fivers. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, a lot of their practices are actually very close to the, to the Sunnis in terms, of, in terms of, of legal institutions, in terms of 
of a lot of their thinking goes along the lines of, 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 the, of Sunni, uh, prominent Sunni schools of uh, jurisprudence. But the difference is they believe in, Im in an imam. And that's, of course, Sunnis do not have an imam. So that makes a very different type of, a, uh, of an organization. But the way they developed was under a man named um, Madradin uh, al Husi, who was a, a very venerated cleric living north around Saada, um, a traditional strong Zaidi stronghold. Um, and he was in his, well, his late years, 70s and 80s, and started to develop a, a movement in which um, he believed that it was important to, to restore traditional Zaidi values to, to Yemen, which over the past hmm. uh, 20, 30 years has increasingly gone towards uh, a Salafism, a Salafism brought in by the Saudis. Uh, brought many Wahhabi clerics came in and started to preach uh, uh, Salafi teachings, which are very, very uh, 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 distant from those of Zaydism. You don't have the same uh, types of restrictions on, on you know, based on music, on, on uh, uh, the basic uh, conservatism which you have under uh, Salafi, Salafism. Also, the Islah party started in Yemen, which the Muslim Brothers. Um, that also was, was our very antagonist towards the Zaydis because they viewed the Zaydis as being, again, the imam. They didn't want to imam it. They want to have a different concept as well. But uh, Badr al-Din decided that uh, this is something which they wanted to preserve uh, uh, Yemen's historic adherence to the Zaydis. The former imams of Yemen that were overthrown in 1962, uh, Imam Badr was the last imam. Um, they fought a civil war, which came out conclusions uh, until 1970. Um, was large between the Zaydis and the Shafis, who were uh, who were largely. Uh, uh so, so Imam Bada was Imam of all Yemen, yes, north of all and Yemen. south. No, only north. Uh, south Yemen has been historic. Yemen has always included northern and southern Yemen, um, about in the 16, 1700s. But then you had uh, Yemen itself was split. The southern areas um, became British colony. Um, you know, they have very sultanates in Hadramaut and Dofor. Yes, yes. And all, the, and, and all those uh, governments to the south of, of, of the southern tier around Aden. It's always been, the quite, north it's always been quite independent. The Turks invaded twice. The last time thrown out was in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the Yemenis were, were very good warriors uh, and they wanted to protect themselves. And under Imam Yahya, who ruled from 1904 until 1948, he largely uh, closed off uh, the, the kingdom of Yemen from other, from the government of Yemen, from other countries in order to keep the Germans, the Italians, the Brits from occupying. And uh, the Brits didn't want to see the Germans in there, and they didn't want to see the Italians in there. Towns, of course, being across uh, in later years, 1930s in, uh, in uh, uh, Abyssinia, Ethiopia. Um, so he managed to maintain his independence, but closed himself off very much. So he had very few books written about Yemen. There's a very good book written in the 1940s by a guy named Hughes, which is a, a good description of a visit to the Imam. And the, way the Imam was a very uh, just ruler. Um, he, you had a large Jewish community living in Yemen at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jews in Yemen had a special role in society. It was forbidden to, uh, to attack a Jewish home or a Jewish community in terms of tribal conflict. Um, as a result, they had certain restrictions. They couldn't, for example, in Sana'a build their houses above the city wall. Uh, Yemeni architecture, these dramatic sort of skyscrapers, four, five, mm. six-story tall buildings, even taller down in the southern part of the country, but these beautiful buildings, and the architecture is extraordinarily um, uh, uh, famous in Yemen. And the, the Jewish houses have a different, different character, these houses. And in Qal Olafi, an area of Sana'a, there's a region which is a, uh, the former Jewish quarter, and the houses are, are very unique. They have alabaster windows, which bring light in, filtered light in. Mm. Um, but a very different society under Imam Yahya. Imam Yahya took over, there was a coup against him, some pretenders took over, they were thrown out after about a year by Imam Ahmed that took over. He ruled throughout the turbulent 50s with Nasser coming in. In any event, the Zaydis uh, sort of ran out of steam in 1962. There was a nationalist revolt under, under Nasser. And then you had a civil war which pitted Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Iran. Uh, well, supporting the royalists against the Russians and the Egyptians who supported the Republicans. And in the end, uh, really the, the royalists did very well in battle, but at the end they withdrew from battle. They never saw any peace treaty withdrew because of a dispute with Saudi Arabia over the outcome. Saudi Arabia wanted to sort of divide and conquer uh, in North Africa. Gosh, it's so complicated. Very complicated, yeah. But the Zaydis, back to the, to the, the, the Zaydis 
it's not a political movement at, at such. It really is probably a uh, social religious movement, the, the uh, Houthi movement, which has become political over the past several years. Abd al-Sal, the president at the time, saw them as being extremists. They have a slogan which is very anti-American, very anti-Israel. It served recruitment purposes. It said something like, death to America, death to Israel, uh, you know, uh, down with the Jews, long live Islam was its, was its main slogan. And that mm. obviously didn't endear themselves to the United States or to the Yemeni government. Um, that used, was used politically against them. Yeah. Although the U.S. has never uh, put them on a terrorism list, they never attacked any American or Western uh, uh, sites. They've been focused solely on on bringing a new uh, tranquility and, and just form of governments to the areas of the country that's which they increasingly occupied. There were six wars against them. Um, Hussein al uh, Hussein al Houthi, Hussein uh, Badr al Houthi, the son, uh, led a campaign. Was in parliament for a while. Led a campaign against the government, and the government uh, killed him in, 19, in 2004. Um, then uh, there was, after a while, his, uh, one of his brothers took over, Abdul Malik took over as being the leading, uh, uh, the leading mm. uh, uh, figure in the Houthi movement. He has since been able to bring other tribes in. Uh, many of the tribes who had, who had changed to Salafism did so because of monetary money given to them. You know, if you change to our views, you can get a little more finance. And people, sure, I'll become Salafi for business. So they really came back to their core, their core values. And when you're, you visit Saada or visit uh, Amran, these cities under uh, Houthi control, it's a very different environment. People, um, it's back to a traditional uh, legal system in some ways, but it's a very good system in which um, people have their property. If there's an issue, it's, it's decided by, by local Qadi. It's not, um, the corruption is not tolerated, so there's much less corruption. There is a lot more uh, peace tranquility. No longer are there any kidnappings in Houthi areas. You can leave. There's no theft. You leave your card, the keys in it. It's, it remains. Uh, it's a very popular movement in that sense. So how much of the country do the Houthi control? Well, at the moment, the Houthis are in a very strong position throughout uh, the northern part of Yemen, through Sana'a, and down in areas towards Taiz. Um, they've been in, in Ib. It's a major city between Taiz and Sana'a. Um, the reason why they're doing so well, the army is not fighting them as much because they, the Houthis have a, there's sort of a popular resurgence of people have come to support them. Tribes are supporting them. Um, Abdul Sal himself was a Zaidi. I mean, the uh, Sanhan tribe is a Zaidi tribe. So even some of them have, have joined the Houthi movement. But I think it's important to put them in context. Um, president uh, al-Badi remains president of the country, um, has done an excellent job since to Abdul Sal in trying to resolve the, these four issues which, which, which create the political dynamic for, for Yemen. First one is, of course, the issue of the Houthi. Second one, more pertinent, is one of Al-Qaeda, which is gaining a strong mm -hmm. foothold and is very violent uh, insurgents in the South. The U.S., of course, um, is engaged in that in a way which is, is questionable, but at least we're trying to, to contain that very unsuccessfully. And the, f the, f the other issue is the issue of secession in the South. The South wants to be free again. Yes, it does, yeah. And at the moment, they don't have uh, th the leadership probably that they need in order to do that, but there's real movement for them to secede from the North. So the Houthis may indeed provide a, um, uh, a solution to these issues, if indeed there's... It's three issues now. <coughs> well, there's the, the Houthis, the Al-Qaeda, uh, the South, and well, the other one's been taken care of, which was um, <laughs> the, the Hashid who were the political opponents of uh, supporters of Abdul Saleh. Um, they are also a Zaidi tribe, but very close to the Saudis. And they've been sort of pushed aside by the Houthis who took okay. over their, their homeland. Okay. So, um, so essentially, we're going to see, I mean, you talk about Al-Qaeda. We, we, we're not dealing with Al-Qaeda because we've been yeah. had a policy of bombing them, essentially, which has, has increased support for them rather than yeah. decreased yeah. support for them. But, um, but in other respects, and it did increase their numbers because they started off with about 200 10 years ago mm. and now they're yeah. countless. Um, but in other respects, Yemen is a success story, is what No, you it's not a success story because you have such chaos at the moment. Uh, the Houthis are trying to bring that chaos into order. Until you can get, um, get a, a government in Sana'a which can take you, the Houthis are against Al-Qaeda. You have to get Al-Qaeda has got to be eliminated. You've understood about the South. That has to be done in a political framework. 
There was a uh, process of reconciliation which established a, a, a division of the country to six different units, six regional governments. That was one of the things the Houthis wanted to have a port out of that. That was not given to them, so they've taken a port. It's one of those situations where the country still is in very much disequilibrium. But while everybody sits back and talks about, about doing things, our focus is on other areas, on, on ISIS, on, on the Iran negotiations, on, on Ebola in West Africa. It's not focused on what's happening in Yemen. So there should be discussions really to bring Saudi and the Houthis together. Is that yeah, it'd be very helpful if that would happen. The Saudis have taken a view very antagonist towards the Houthis. Um, there's a, there's a feeling in Sana'a by those who oppose them, who think they're going to bring back the Imam, the Imanet, the Hamidadeen family, uh, who are, are very fine, fine people. They'd be a very good ruling family should they take over again. The new, the new generation is a very well-educated group of, of young men. But that's not going to happen. Um, they want indeed to, to have a, a formulation of government which would be much more Zaidi, much more open, much more um, resilient than, than it's been in the past. Interesting. So, I mean, and, and so prospects, there is hope for Yemen. There's and hope then, for I Yemen. I mean, it's not yeah. in the cat catastrophic situation that Iraq is. Well, well the, or, or the, Iraq yeah, even yeah. Is the hope, two I problems suppose. you have in Yemen, as in many countries, is overpopulation now. Uh, when I was in Yemen back in the 1970s, there were 6 million Yemenis. That mm. was in the north. There are now 20, 25, 26, 27 million Yemenis. Mm. They've been. Uh, uh, another million have been sent out of Saudi Arabia uh, because of, you know, they were trying to clean up their own immigration policies there, so they've been sent home. That's a disruptive influence in, in Sana'a. The main issue in Sana'a is the problem of water. They're running out of water in Yemen. Uh, this is a key, key factor. Um, climate change has impacted Yemen. There are not as many monsoons. There used to be two monsoons. Now mm -hmm. there's, you know, one and a half, if that. So there's a big problem with water that has to be faced up by any government coming in as well. That has not been addressed in the past uh, 40 years. Interesting. So Yemen rumbles on, Iraq, Syria rumbles on. Let's, have we got a little bit of a glimmer of hope with regard to our final major issue, that of the Middle East peace process? So are we, um, um, we've seen ca catastrophic events over the summer of 2014, right? You know, I mean, um, where are we going with this? Is there, is there, is there hope for an American-led peace process? William, you've given us three issues where we look for some hopeful solutions, and here's another where there is no hopeful solution, I'm afraid, uh, at the moment, in the offing. Uh, to say the Americans should lead a peace process, I think our time has passed on that in many ways. Um, what have we done in the past? We've told, trust us, we'll get the Israelis, Palestinians together. That has not worked. We've sort of lost our, our, our ability to say we're even-handed. Um, we got close to it with Clinton, though. We got close to some close sort of resolution, yeah, Clinton, especially but in again, his second yeah. term. But that yeah. didn't work, did it? And things have marched on since then quite, uh, quite heavily. You have no historic figures which can bring this together. At the moment, you have in, in power in, in, uh, in Israel, you have a, a right-wing government um, led by uh, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu, he, who is, you know, he's not at all a friend of the peace process, I don't think. I think he has, he has tried to present himself to the U.S. as being very much in favor of peace, but has to make sure security of Israel is paramount importance to him, which indeed is a consideration. But in fact, there's been a lot, great deal of insincerity. If you follow what he's done, every time Kerry would go into Jerusalem and say nice words, next to another 500 settlements would be created. And the settlement issue is something which is it's like a cancer, it's metastasized, it's destroyed the peace process. If you, uh, last, uh, uh, a couple of days ago in the New York Times, there was an op-ed by Naftali Bennett, the Minister of mm -hmm. Economy, the, one, the head of the, uh, 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 the Israel Home Party. There's 12 seats at the Knesset, the leader of the settlement movement in many ways. And the topic was the, the time of the two-way solution has passed. Mm. And he promotes a one-state a one solution which is appalling in terms of its implications. Basically, he says um, it's, it, it's presented in a way which is very compelling for someone who doesn't understand the history of the problem, uh, the, the issues which, which make the Palestinians so, um, so angry with, with Westerners and with uh, the Israelis. It presents a situation where he says, well, we, there's eight zones A, B, and C in the West Bank. Um, 
let's take zones A and B, which are Palestinian. We'll give them their autonomy. We'll give them more rights to, we we'll give them uh, to mm -hmm. you know develop or move the roadblocks, that sort of thing. And zone three, we'll incorporate that into Israel property. Because after all, any peace process that would be part of part of Israel anyways. And Palestinians living there would be given er, would be given Israeli uh, uh, citizenship. And Gaza, it sort of operates like state of itself, but because Hamas is a terrorist organization, we don't deal with them at all. It doesn't discuss Gaza. 1.8 million people are pushed aside. And that's it. He says, we, he, now, now, Pally Bennett is a very successful businessman. He's 42 years of age. I've had two companies, which he sold for $100 million each, a software brilliant man. And he says, indeed, we can, we can, we can have an economic miracle in the West Bank with, our, with help from Israeli entrepreneurs. It all sounds very good. But it's not going to happen, I'm afraid. Uh, it, it ignores the basic reasons why there is so much uh, frustration with the peace process, why these current incidents are taking uh, can place. We, can we have a different approach? I mm. mean, the, the, the failure of the peace process has been mm. the fact that, in, well, part of the failure mm. has been the fact it's bilateral discussion, which means that one party is strong, the other party is weak. Mm -hmm. um, the if we went, if we, if we, uh, all the focus was on a comprehensive peace process, on discussion, uh, where the Arab states stood with Palestine in the negotiation, then the bilateralism would be ended. You'd have two parties that were of some weight because you, the Arab states as a whole would be counterpoint to Israel. And you could, you could move forward on the Abdullah plan, possibly. I mean, I'm very keen on the phased introduction yeah, of the yeah. Abdullah plan rather than trying to do everything all at once step by step with yep. regard to the, yep. well, I'm uh, sorry, the Arab plan, but yep. the same thing, yep. Abdullah plan. The, um, you could move forward far better if a nation like America, I, I, disagree, I think America is in the lead because there's nobody else, mm. not because it's, it's by default. And they have, you have a Secretary of State uh, in his last couple of years uh, who wants some heritage. I mean, there is an opportunity to do something, um, it, it's it, it easier in a way to deal with this than to deal with ISIS or many of the other crises we're talking about in the region. Can't we get some energy for this? Well, there should be some energy for this. I think certainly Secretary Kerry has done a very good job in terms of putting worked some hope hard, in this. Worked hard, doesn't Worked yeah. very hard. But the way he was insulted personally by the Israelis doing this, the man gives uh, gets an, an A plus in my in my book for uh, turning the other cheek and going back again to try to get Netanyahu to behave properly, uh, fairly in these issues. But I think you have to have historic figures dealing on this. The Israelis, who do you deal with on the Israeli side? The, the political segment in, in Israel is becoming more hard, more hard, hard, uh, hardened towards a, a one state solution which supports Israel, Israel only. And the Palestinian side is very divided as well. You need to have historic figures come to come to play. We don't have those at the moment. They but I mean, that. what you may not have historic figures on the Israel or Palestinian side, but you could, could, couldn't President Obama do a Clinton step in and you know with Kerry, but uh, but actually step in and take personal interest in the Israel-Palestine peace process? I think it's too late now. The uh, elections just took place in the U.S. Uh, recently. Um, they were a a terrible loss for, for Obama personally. Yes, yes, I appreciate And that. you have to have the Congress supporting this effort. The new Republican leadership in both houses take a very, very, uh, you know, was anti But I mean, Clinton was doing it when he was disempowered. He had all that scandal, all that going on, and yet he pursued this. But he had strong support from, from the American Jewish community and from the Israelis. As the large segment of Israelis side support from that effort as well. You don't have that. You don't have an Ehud uh, Barak as, as prime minister. You have Benjamin Netanyahu, who has indicated he will not play that role. Also, you have a problem, too. You no longer have um, you know, Syria is in chaos. Uh, Saudi Arabia mm. is diverted. Yeah. Egypt is focused on, on, on the Muslim brothers on domestic issues. It has to look out for Libya on, on the ones. There isn't the same kind of a, of a, um, of a region. I'd like to be more positive. I yeah, really would. Yeah. But I have, you know, I'm afraid. You leave me thinking I want to go <laughs> crawl into a hole and <laughs> go to sleep like yeah, Rip Van Winkle yeah, and wake yeah. up in a hundred well, years' that, time yeah, when all the world yeah. might be different. I think it would be it'd be <coughs> useful, I think, if we focused on, on Gaza first and foremost and got that blockade lifted. Well, that's a good thing. And put it, work yes. on that, put a, put a process in. You can open up the, the, 
uh, that one approached by um, to open up a, a part, port, part of Port Limassol in Cyprus to Gaza, put on UN control both ends to make sure you can import things in and out, start that way. Mm -hmm. You should get an airport established. You should start to make sure the monies which have been pledged for reconstruction can be used for reconstruction. You've got to get the sea uh, border yes, open. Yes, it always extraordinary. Because you aren't going to get the land borders yeah, open. Yeah. And that, I think, would be, be something we could work on. Um, and it gets some momentum moving in that direction. Yeah. That might, might build some confidence between uh, the parties. But the Temple Mount situation has become volatile. That wasn't in play before. That's a very volatile situation now as well. Um, that's creating all sorts of, yes. of new uh, incidents in Israel with these, these truck ramming people down, running down people and stuff. That's, that's that, that is wonderful for the, the Israeli extremists who want to see, see uh, 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 further... Uh, uh, deprivation of the Palestinian rights, but that is not something which I think mm. is the benefit for all of us. So it's not a not a happy picture, William. Well, bless you. Well, I hope it'll change, and let's uh, pray to God that it will. Indeed, and that we will get there the the kind of historic figures that you you dream of seeing on the scene. And there are there figures are a few, if yeah, they there come are, into play. Yeah, you yeah. know, the Marwan Bagutis exactly. of this world. Who are there? Um, and on the Israeli to side too, there are figures as well. The 115 generals uh, who very signed a petition yes. uh, last uh, recently, um, stating that there has to be a peace process. Um, we have to empower these people, not not let uh, Israelis lose hope too, because there are, are many same that side that want to see a safe, peaceful, and prosperous uh, Palestine-Israel equation. Bless you, Mark. Thank you. Well. Well, we have, really thank you for being our guest. We have one last issue, as always in this new series of programs, which is going to, we're going to talk about a book. Absolutely. Well, bless you. I, I, now I, we have to find the book. This book is a New York Times top 10 bestseller. It's actually only just released in Britain. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, only just. And um, and here it's up till now been only available in hardback, but it is, I believe, just about to come out in paperback, or just coming out in paperback. Lawrence in Arabia by Scott Anderson. Um, and it's uh, a tome. It's a it's major. It's a wonderful book. Well, it's certainly a hefty book. I mean, quite something. You can swat flies with it, William. Published, yes. Published by Atlantic Books, London. So it's a, an unusual publisher, um, but uh, but an unusual book by the looks of it. Well, let me talk about it. Yeah, bit, tell me, tell me. Okay. Well, this is Lawrence in Arabia. People go look for Lawrence. It's not Lawrence. Lawrence in Arabia. It's a wonderful story. It tells the story of, of Lawrence's operations uh, during the First World War, his whole creation of you know with the the Arab forces taking over you know. Aqaba, all that bit, and the, uh, but it does so through a very interesting framework. The framework of four spies. One's a German named Kurt Prufer. One's a Jewish gentleman named Aaron Aronson. And the third is, is an American, William Yale, the only American spy in the whole Middle East during that time. And the fourth is Lawrence himself. And how these four people all sort of intersect throughout the period of 1915, 1918 is oh. fascinating. The Germans, of course, want to... Um, create a, 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 a third front which would be effective to thwart, thwart the Indian army and thwart the, the uh, British in Egypt. Mm. Um, and Kurt Prufer had a, had a boss who they started to have a jihad against, uh, against the British. It didn't work, but that's what he tried to encourage. You have another figure comes into play, um, uh, na namely um, uh, the uh, uh, Kamal Pasha, who is the... Um, Andre Pasha, who's the head of the Syrian vilayet under the Turks, one of the young Turks. He's a very key figure in this. At uh, one point during the Armenian genocide in, in Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, there are 10,000 Armenians flow into Aleppo, and he, they're about to be slaughtered. He says, no, these people have done nothing. We'll keep these people here. We use them productively, and he saved a lot of lives that way. The intersection of all these people is fascinating. The most effective aspiring during this time, won't well, surprise, I think, our listeners, was the Jewish spy ring by Aaron Aronson, yeah. who fed all sorts of information about Turkish movements to the Brits, which made their their attacks eventually uh, against uh, Palestine. Well, when you say Jewish, we're talking prior to any the, Jewish exactly. state. No, no, this, this was a, a, yeah, this is a uh, kibbutz formed in Palestine. Uh, the early Jewish settlers of the 
um, 19th century came in. This is a, he formed. A, he was a scientist, an agronomist, a very successful farmer, um, and had a whole kibbutz which he ran. And he saw writing on the wall being um, with the Turks eliminating the Armenians. Would they be next? So he he made sure that he saw the British as being more um, lenient taskmaster to win the war. Right. That's what he was looking for. And there's uh, his play coming to London. And then, of course, then there's the Balfour Declaration. Sykes Picot is discussed in this book in a very interesting, interesting fast as well. But it's a very good. It looks very light as a long book, but it's a, it's one of those page turners. If you're interested in the Middle East, you'll be very interested in this book. It's got wonderful pictures. A picture of of, uh, of the uh, Arab battalion with with Faisal in it marching uh, on on Wej, the uh, port in Saudi Arabia, what is currently Saudi Arabia, in Hejaz. Push the Turks out. It's a it's a wonderful tale. Um, shows how Lawrence got involved in this. Some of his his peculiar uh, uh, fetishes he was involved in as well. But mm -hmm. it's an interesting, interesting account. And I think people who are interested in this period of time. Be will put this on their, their their holiday shopping list. I hope. Well, bless you, Mark. Thank you for bringing it to okay. our yeah. attention. Lawrence in Arabia. By Excellent. Scott Anderson. Scott Anderson. Bless your heart. Thank you, and thank you for being. Our guest it's on a pleasure. I hope, television. Hope next I have a little better news for you. Yeah, but, well, uh, I should hope so. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Let's just remember that the glass is always half full. As yes. long as they think, think in that context, we can find solutions to some of these problems, which, which are so sad for a part of what we, we love so much. Absolutely. Bless your heart. Thank you. Thank you.